Thomas from Prestigious Properties, thank you so much for joining us. Can you please tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and, and how you got here? Well, it depends how much time I want to talk about this. You know, I can give you a few minutes or several hours. I mean, <laughs> you, you spend several decades, you know, there's lots to tell. Um, I Written turned 60 the Written. other a few weeks ago. so. Um, I am the president of two companies, really. One is uh, an asset holding entity, asset you know, acquisition and, and improvement company, which is called Prestigious Properties, which owns a number of mobile home parks as well as uh, apartment buildings, down from its peak at about $125 million in assets down to de today. We own about $44 million worth of assets. And I also own uh, a small development company. We're building currently a, a townhouse project in Okanagan in Oliver, um, which doesn't go on the press prop. It goes under Oliver Landing. And then, of course, I have, you know, I have kids and I have a wife. So there's lots to tell about that. And uh, we, we uh, have been syndicating these buildings and including the Oliver Landing project through investors for the last almost two decades now. So I started in earnest buying my first building about 20 years ago in the year 2000, having bought a few condos and houses before that. And I realized after I bought my first condo in 1997 for $80,000 and bought you know two more that, gee, I realized uh, condos or apartments are priced like flour or sugar. So if you and I go to the to a Safeway and buy some sugar or some flour, you know, we pay a certain price per pound, right? Now, if you and I were a baker, we would buy a hundred pounds or a thousand pounds, where we pay less less per unit, right? And I realized that that same principle applies for buildings. So if you buy a condo for eighty thousand, well, that's a good individual retail price. But I was wondering, well, what what does a house, a whole building cost? Well, at the time in the year two thousand. In Edmonton, an average apartment building was going for between thirty-five and forty-five thousand dollars a unit. So I realized that's a lower price, so I might as well buy the whole building and not just one condo. So that's where I started, and then I grew a company from there. Wow. Um, hmm. So, so I uh, I really like that philosophy. Um, I, I, we one thing we do want to actually touch on is the impact of this virus and how it's impacted the Alberta market and BC and what the evolution is going to like look like coming out of that. Uh, but first, I want, I want to go further back. Um, so can you talk about the evolution of going from uh, the one off properties into the, the having more an apartment style uh, buildings right. and, and then and then also going from using your own capital to raising capital or using other people's money? Uh, however you want to call it. Sure. Um, I mean, real estate is a, is a great business um, which can be done full time or part time. Um, but if you buy you know, one condo, or one house, you cannot live on that. So obviously, if you want to make a living at real estate, you need to buy quite a few buildings, right? You need a, a several million dollars of assets under management. Otherwise, the, the cash flow is just not strong enough. But it lends itself as a great business part time. So that's how I started in the 90s, because I was a software engineer and a software marketing uh, uh, person at IBM. And then later with my own company with a guy in California. And I just didn't have the time to spend looking for real estate full time. So you start part time, right? And at the time when I bought my first condo, it, the offering was to buy rental pooled building. Uh, not just the whole building, but 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 one unit. But someone else would manage the, the finding the tenants and managing the rents and, and evictions and all the process involved in, with with managing a, a large building, which at the time a I didn't know about and didn't have the time certainly to to do that. So, but the idea of you buy a condo for eighty thousand, 
and the rent is maybe six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, which covers all your expenses. So you put twenty thousand bucks down, get a mortgage for sixty thousand roughly. So the rent minus your condo fees and minus your management fees covers your mortgage payments more or less. Maybe get a bit of cash flow. And I did three of those, and then I bought my first building, which was a 15-unit building, and then I bought with my own money, and then I bought a 20-unit building with my own money. And then I saw all these deals out there, and, and the prices were going up every year, three, four, five percent in Edmonton. Mm. And I realized, look, I should buy a few more buildings, because at the time you buy a building, let's say, with uh, 20 percent down, right? And your your rent goes up. 5% a year or your value goes up 5% a year plus you pay a mortgage down so you get a 40 to 50% return on your cash uh, in, a, in a rising market so well, this, this is an, an awesome business model I got to buy as many as I can well obviously I didn't have an unlimited checkbook um, and didn't have as much time either but so I was I was buying buildings at the time for about one building a year sort of in the early 2000s because I, I could find time for that because buying a building is is, is work intensive but again it's not full-time either certainly more work intensive than buying a condo but you can delegate that to property managers and you, you hire appraisers and, and realtors get you know like colliers in fact one of the the active guys uh, most active realtor I, I used to work with and still work with today was Ahmed Grover who then was with colliers right since he has, has left Colliers and is with another firm, but Amit and I you know, bought a, a number of buildings in the, in the Edmonton area in, in the 2000s and sold a few. Um, but so I, you, you, you realize very quickly that if you want to buy more assets in real estate, you got to have more money. Well, the money comes either from your own genes or from someone else's genes, right? There's only two ways to get money. Either it's your own money or it's someone else's. Now, banks are obviously one money partner, but banks don't usually lend you 100% of the building value, right? There, there used to be that crazy time, perhaps in the US, you could get 105% of your property value, but that's not common, right? Right. So today, the bank might lend you 80%. At the time, they were lending 85 with CMHC. Today, that's difficult. Maybe you can get 70 75%. That means you need still 20 to 25% cash plus some holding costs and upgrade costs. Let's call it 30%. Needs to come from someone. So you need to now reach out to your network of people and start syndicating an asset. That's what I did around 2003, 2004 in my own personal network of people I knew. And then I started using limited partnerships and offering memorandums to. Uh, to syndicate buildings, and we still do that to this day, right? We use an OM, offer memorandum, or LP units, or, or corporate shares, depending on the structure, to gather money from other people. And uh, there's obviously a whole rules around that with the security commissions you have to be, be mindful of. Um, but that's how you get the money. And then you, you take a share, you take a management fee, usually maybe an acquisition fee, and you take usually a share of profits. Right. And that can be lucrative for all parties involved. Of course, the last few years in Alberta haven't been so sexy. So the last LPs weren't perhaps as, as good as the early ones. Because right. as, right. as you know, Alberta is, you know, has been hit hard with low oil prices and, and a recession probably now for almost five years, right? Right. And now that the federal government isn't isn't usually helping you guys, so. Well, indirectly they do with CMHC, but as you know, even getting a CMHC mortgage today is a lot more complicated than it was perhaps 10 years ago or even five years ago. Right. In the beginning, the first, I think, six or seven buildings I bought were all with CMHC money. And my rule at the time was I will not pay more than 15% down. So 85% wow. leverage was the get-go from the get-go. And that was very profitable in the early years because the market was rising very fast. And you could still cash flow even with six, seven percent interest rates at the time, with fifteen percent down. Today that's difficult because the cap rates are lower, and, and of course the bank doesn't lend you eighty-five percent anymore. Right? right. So today the cash and cash returns tend to be lower than they were, you know, fifteen, eighteen years ago. They they still help though. They still, at least in Toronto, they're they're at about seventy-five percent of the purchase price, which is not so bad. Yeah, exactly. Correct. 
Yeah, and, and as long as you go to smaller towns, we actually ended up going not just into Calgary and Edmonton, but also into smaller towns where you you still get higher cap rates buildings. And often, as you see, we see it makes a lot of sense in right. smaller towns. You know, we did like with Tasquin and Camrose and Powell River and Campbell River and uh, Fox Creek and, you know, many, many smaller markets, which we since all sold. But, but you know, many of them have been quite profitable, not all of them, but most have been quite profitable too in smaller markets. So can you walk me through how that process works? So you you find maybe a 100 unit building in Edmonton um, and you put in an offer. Are you are you going out and finding equity partnerships uh, during the conditional period? Are you like at what stage are you bringing in those partners and establishing a, you know, a new LP or, or however you structure it? Well, let me ask you, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, uh, I mean, the, religious. That, that's that's the trick. I mean, again, usually you don't start with 100 unit building, right? You, in fact, the first time I bought my 100 unit building was in the year 2004, and all of a sudden every realtor in Edmonton would know me because that year only two buildings transacted over 100 units. Well, I own, I bought one of them. So guess what? These transactions are so rare that all of a sudden everyone knew about you and could and would invite you for, for, for lunch, right? I had lots of free lunches that year or that following year to, to, to look for my assets. So you tend to buy smaller buildings first, 15 units, 12 plexus, 8 plexus, 20 plexus, in my case, 24 plexus, and to build a track record, right? And then you go maybe to 30 units or 40 units and all of a sudden you realize there is actually a smaller universe now of buyers and sellers because as you go up the curve, people tend to be more sophisticated, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there's very few buildings today, for example, for sale over 100 units, because most are owned by Boardwalk or Main Street or a bunch of other REITs or private investors. They're very rarely for sale, right? So the trick is essentially what you build, you build a database of, 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 of investors or potential investors. And whenever you come across a building which makes sense, you then send out an, an email and say, hey, I got this building and here's the terms I envision. Are you interested? Yes or no? And I'm going to raise, let's say, $2 million and the minimum investment is, let's say, twenty-five dollars or $50,000. I, I sell units at, let's say, 10000 bucks a unit. Would you like to buy one of these units? And, and here's the term sheet and here's the envisioned returns based on some assumptions. Um, mm -hmm. And you gotta hustle because obviously you, know, you have maybe two months to waive conditions, right? right? So you write an offer and you look at the building, and say, okay, that's a good building to buy. I get my appraisals and my condition reports. I got at most usually six, eight, maybe ten weeks to waive my conditions, right? Right. So it's an extremely stressful period of time to actually raise that money because I want to know that the money is in the bank before I waive conditions and write a second deposit of perhaps a quarter million dollars, right? Right. Um, so what we did in the later years, probably 2005, 2006 and forward, we tend to, we were raising money independent of the building. So we say, well, here's a typical building, but we might not buy this building. We might, might buy a building two streets over. With the numbers would be similar. It might not be exactly the same, but it might not be an 18 plex, but it might be a 24 plex. But right. it, it might not be 56 a door, it might be 62 a door, right? But maybe you units a bit bigger. So the numbers in the end are somewhat similar. So you do almost like a blind pool. So we did that for probably a decade from about 05 to 2015. You bought basically, we had a pool of cash and we, but then with that we deployed capital. And it, it often was more than one building. So the biggest raise, the biggest raise was in one of our LPs was $15 million. And we ended up buying about six buildings actually, it was seven buildings in that in that LP. One is still there today. We've sold the other ones. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, Garrett and I are taking notes here. Um, <laughs> and and uh, and and can you give us a little context? So you mentioned you you know you you've written a book, uh, eighty lessons from eighty thousand to eighty million. I'm butchering the title, but you know something like that. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a co context of, you know, how many units do you currently have um, and where are they located? What's what's the scale of prestigious properties right now? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, at, at the peak, we, we, we managed, which was around, let me say, 2014, maybe. 
we managed about a thousand units, or owned a thousand units, um, with a value of about $125 million. Right. Um, that was maybe a dozen buildings in, in a variety of locations in an, on across a number of LPs. We have since, because maybe I'm getting older and lazier or not as active perhaps, um, we, did, we had to sell off a number of buildings, plus the numbers were getting worse and worse, right? It was tougher to buy actually buildings in, in, in Canada because the cap rates got so low. Um, today we own about 400 units, um, 240 units on buildings and another 200 units roughly in, in mobile home parks, so in pads. Um, and, and the team is smaller, and, and then the number of investors are smaller. But we're looking to, you know, to to acquire perhaps some other apartment buildings in, in the U.S. Perhaps with another group, perhaps by some mobile home parks on a one, one on a one-off basis. So we're still out there looking at buildings every so often. And I think with this COVID situation right now, we're going to see some opportunities because um, for every distressed seller, there is a motivated buyer, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We 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 actually sold a, a building just in early March in Edmonton. So we are sitting currently on you know over a million dollars in cash, looking to deploy that somewhere. Right. Probably somewhere in Alberta or BC. That's the current thinking. You know. Stepping back just slightly, Thomas, um, can you give our our listeners a bit of a breakdown of what mobile home parks are, and how they contrast with, and how are they different than say like traditional multifamily type of buildings? Yeah, I mean, it's another form of multi-unit, multi-family, even to call it. The, the, the main difference is that in a mobile home park, you do not own the home. The home is typically owned by the, the person who lives in the home. You own just the land. So you, you lease the land to the home owner. And, you know, we have a park in Cranbrook. The rent is about 350 That's sort of the low end. And we have another one, we have four at the moment. One is in Rocky Mountain House, the rent is about 530 to 540 per pad, right? So the, the pad is, is pad rental is, is location dependent. And, and the benefit is that you get very steady cash flow. The, the number of vacancies are very low because you carry a big stick, right? If you don't pay your rent every month, I'm going to take your most prized possession away, namely your home. Even if it's an old 30, 40 year old home, it's still worth five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. It's your home. You've lived there for a long time. I can take that away if you don't pay my pay the pad rent, right? So the rent tends to be very sticky versus you live in an apartment, you pay 800 bucks a month, you own maybe some old furniture and a mattress. And guess what? If you lost the job or you move back with your buddies, you're gone. I don't even find you. And you just skip your last month's rent and you leave all the crap behind in the apartment, literally and metaphorically speaking, and you can't collect it even, right? So that happens certainly in a recession like right now. There is a lot more turnover and vacancies and, and, and non-collection as well, because the guy disappears. I don't even know where he is, right? He moved back with Buddy, he moved to a different town. First, in a mobile home park, we have almost no non-collections, right? The, the non-collection happens usually when the person is about to die or very, very sick, right? That happens occasionally, but most people are always find money at the end of the day to pay you because they know I can take your home away. That's, you know, and get that takes a few months and a court order and stuff, but eventually you get the court order and guess what? I own your home now. And now I get, I can resell that for three or four or $5,000. So and people will make sure that they don't do that. That doesn't happen. It happens extremely rarely. In in Ontario, in April and May, we saw about ninety five percent of rent collected, uh, pretty pretty well across the board, secondary markets and and as well as uh, Toronto Core. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, what did you see in your portfolio for traditional apartments and then mobile home? Mobile same, home. same basically, similar. I mean, mobile homes. Close to 100. There's there is the always the, the, there's the always the stragglers and people who drink too much or find excuses. Right. But eventually they pay. You know, if there was maybe more delays than usual, a few more days, of a week or so, or two weeks, and but yeah, 95, 96 percent in the buildings and and slightly higher in mobile home parks. Um, we'll see how long this lasts, right? I mean, at some point the money, the 2,000 bucks a month might might run out. 
in BC, for example, you get another 500 bucks rent subsidies. I think that's the only province, to my knowledge, in, in, in Canada. But the 2,000 bucks a person does help, right? So if you have a couple, that's 4,000 bucks. There's really no excuse to not pay your rent. I was gonna, I was gonna loop us back a bit to, um, to COVID and sort of the fall of oil. How is that going to be impacting the Alberta market for sort of the near term future? Well, Alberta is, has been had, has been hit three times now, I'd say, because first they had the NDP government, which like any left wing government is never good for the economy. They racked up a lot of debt. Uh, and then Kenny got elected about a year ago now. He's trying to turn the ship around uh, successfully, but he needs to cut public sector spending, which caused a lot of uproar. That's the first issue right now. Then, then oil prices were low. That's not good for Alberta. The whole pipeline delays doesn't help Alberta. Um, and although we see some, I think these trends mountain should go ahead now. And then COVID, like anywhere else, will hit it hard. So I think Alberta is in for a rough ride for the next two or three years for sure. Um, right. and so therefore, if, you, if you're looking to buy in Alberta, and we are looking, you got to be very careful where you buy, because especially commercial real estate uh, is hit really, really hard. Retail malls, you know, commercial centers with restaurants in them, very, very hard and low, low uh, rents. Residential, we shall see. I mean, if, if you have a high unemployment rate, that does impact your tenants eventually. So what is what's the vacancy rate for uh, apartments out there in, in Alberta? Um, you know, I, I and I know, you know, in Alberta, you have very different product than we have in Toronto. I, you know, I, I have a sense that there's a lot of newer buildings trend, transacting and then there's still older product there. Um, what, what sort of vacancies are you seeing? Well, we, we sold all the let's call it non-performing or, or, or below average performing assets over the last few years, especially in, in smaller towns, which often get hit harder with by, by recessions. We have only two buildings left at the moment. One is a, and they're each 120 units, and one is in Edmonton and one is in Calgary. And they're both sort of in the five, six percent. I think Calgary even lower than that might be one, two or three percent. There might be two or three vacancies and turnover out of 120 units. I think that one Edmonton maybe has seven or eight vacancies out of 120. Um, but you 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 but you can find buildings which are far more vacant than that, especially older ones, in 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 you know poor conditions in, in maybe sub you know sub B sub C areas, you get 25 30 percent vacancies. It's not at, at all unusual. Wow. Um, and, and then as as you mentioned, there's a lot of newer buildings. There's probably a lot of probably overbuilt actually. Probably too many new buildings were built. And of course, they're sucking out tenants out of older buildings at perhaps lower rents than they had initially forecasted, right? And often, some of the buildings were meant to be condo buildings, and I realized you know they can't sell enough condos, so that they, they leave them as as rental buildings, or at least some units. They might some are big are mixed use. They, they maybe sold half the condos, and the other half are now rented. Yeah. Um, and and they're often the lease up period takes some time. You also get 20% vacancies, perhaps, you know. But you get new and shiny, new dish and dishwasher and a new, a new wash and dryer, which you often don't have in older buildings. Right. Um, so it's really all over the map. I mean, we are, as I said, sort of in the maybe three to eight percent vacancy range, which is maybe normal at right now. Uh, certainly at lower rents, though, than there were perhaps two or three years ago, or certainly five years ago. Mm -hmm. But there is many buildings which are far more vacant than that. Right. And how and how are you are, are you buying right now? Are you out there buying apartments, looking for opportunities? And no. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm always looking. Okay. All right. But, but, but uh, by and large, I'm sitting on my ass sets. So right. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> um, so obviously, the first goal is always to 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 improve and optimize what you own. Right. But as I mentioned, we just sold a big building. We had some redemptions from investors to get them out, um, and but we're looking to buy, um, and we're looking in BC. I would prefer to buy in BC. The economy is, is probably slightly better, and, and it's the only warm weather, warm weather province of, of Canada. You have just a lot more people like my age, in their 50s and 60s, moving to BC than to Alberta, right? 
So I'm, I'm fairly bullish on Okanagan and, and Vancouver Island. And that's why I'm doing one project uh, in Okanagan to, to build. Because there's always, I think, demand for new, newly built, especially in a country with immigration and, and especially in a part of the country where people want to move to. And I think that will continue for several decades to come. It's, it's challenging to predict the future, for sure. Um, but what is your assessment of, of where Alberta, like what sort of hit and cap rates do you, do you think buildings will take in Alberta? And, and, and then the same question for BC, if at all. BC always has lower cap rates. Yeah. Or as, I, as I call them now, crap rates. Um, because obviously interest rates are very low. I mean, you, as you know, you, you get CMHC money today, sub 2%, right? In the 1.x yeah. percent range, maybe 1.75. I heard uh, I heard 1.8 percent on a 10-year CMHC loan this morning. Exactly. You know, and 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 so and usually you have about a two and a half percent or so, maybe three percent offset to to cap rates, maybe two percent only. So you could argue four percent cap rate is actually not overpaying, right? Right. Now you, you took and four percent is not unusual in B, in BC at all even lower than that. I mean, Vancouver, for example, you pay lower than that, but you're not buying a building, really. You're buying a piece of land, which happens to have a building on it, and you have, and you intend to rezone that land to build something else in the future. So you're not really buying a, an apartment building. You happen to buy land with a rezoning potential. So different, different metrics apply, right? And therefore, you get 2.5%, 3% cap rates on the as-is income. But if you take that out and you go to other markets where maybe the rezoning is not quite as bullish as it used to be in Alberta or in, in, in Vancouver, 4% is probably normal in BC, 4.5%, 5 maybe in smaller markets, and in, in, in Edmonton, Calgary, maybe 1% higher than that. And then certainly if you leave the big cities to go smaller towns, it's all over the place, you know, between 6 and 10. And then the question is, what vacancy do you apply? Do you apply a sort of stabilized asset vacancy of 5% or do you use a real vacancy rate of 22%? Right. That wouldn't be an, an, at all unusual. You buy a 12 plex and it has three vacancies, that's 25%. Do you use that figure or do you actually use, well, I could do some work and I get it down to one vacancy? So there's always this debate of what what is my expense figure actually? What's the real expenses and what's the real vacancy? And then you massage that number to arrive at some artificial cap rate. So I think in the end, you, you look at other metrics like price per door or price per square foot, right? Or, or cash per door in the end, because in the end, what matters is if I buy a building at 100 a door, how much cash do I actually need? Maybe I need $25,000 a door. So that metric is often more relevant than perhaps, is it a 6% cap rate or 7.2 or 5.9, right? So right. I think you need to look at all, at all of the above and get, can't just be stuck on one on a, on a cap rate. But but they are still low and certainly in BC, you know. So um, one one thing that you mentioned earlier uh, was that you know in a rising market you, you can be what did you say here rising market you can make you're making forty to fifty percent um, cash on cash. Uh, you know it, we might not be in a rising market and and also interest rates are at historic lows, do you think there's still opportunities for uh, for guys who to make fortunes in real estate, especially on the apartment side? Um, where do you are you bullish on on that asset class just just generally uh, as a, as a long term in the long term? Well, generally speaking, they're not making any more old apartment buildings. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, so the, the the universe of existing buildings is is finite, right? Right. And and you got to be very careful how much you pay because you are getting in some buildings to the end of their life cycle and, and buying 40, 50 or Ontario 80 year old buildings. Yeah. Has some risk because now you got pipes in there or boilers from from the 1950s, but before you were born, right? Right. And you wonder, okay, what what is the deferred maintenance? And and you know, sometimes you you look at a building and say, wow, 80 year door it looks like a good deal. But you look at the mold, perhaps, or the the structural termite issues, or or the pipes, or the asbestos. All of a sudden, you get a pump in fifty, eighty thousand dollars a unit in upgrades and 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 and, and deferred maintenance. All of a sudden, it's not such a good deal anymore. Right. 
Um, so I think you've got to be really careful what you buy and what you pay for, given the age of the building and the demographics. Um, but if you pay a decent price and it's a decent location, let's say in, in sort of the greater Toronto area, for example, or Hamilton or, or London or, you know, Waterloo, KWC area, you can always find buildings probably in the low hundreds these days, right? And, and, and apply $10,000, 20000 worth of upgrades per unit on average and still come out good, right? But you got to take a sort of a longer view. You can't just expect to buy for 100, pump in 20 and sell for 140. I think that's very difficult. Um, that they still exist every so often, but you can, I think, build a business model on that. Um, you you can, uh, you know, still make money at that, but it's, it's tight, right? And I think there is certainly opportunity now to build brand new because there will be, especially with COVID now, post-COVID, we're going to see a lot more renters. Uh, I think banks will tighten underwriting for for homeowners. It will be tougher to get a mortgage. Although money is cheap if you can get it, but it still might, they might not give you 80% as they used to, it might give you 70 only. Or oh, they need two incomes now, you know, and, and uh, so people might decide, you know what, I, I maybe need to rent for a bit longer. Right. Um, so I think we're going to see more and more renters and you're going to see, I think, a lot more government programs coming out to subsidize construction of rental properties because the, the, the math often doesn't work. Once you take land prices and, and permit fees and GST and PST and WCB and DCCs and CICs, all these fees you have to pay and, and two year construction lines and two, two years of permitting, right? Um, it takes a long time to build a building. By the time you add the math up, it's like, oh my God, the rents have to be really high for it to make sense. Right. And, mm-hmm. and cities want more affordable housing, right? And the only way to, get to, to do that is with some sort of government subsidies, either land subsidies or building subsidies, or they, they waive certain fees. And you see that happening now more and more in many cities. So I think there's opportunity there. But it's a different business. Building a building and, and owning and, and buying an older building, fixing it up is a different business model, right? Right. They're, they're, they both make sense in the right environment, but they're still different businesses, right? Yeah. So, so uh, Thomas, you've talked about mobile homes, you've talked about apartments. Um, if you, you know, you have a million dollars in equity, imagine you could find an opportunity anywhere and you're, you had networks everywhere. Where is that money going to work and in what asset class? Well, that's a broad question. Like, what car do you like? Well, <laughs> what car do you like? Uh, I mean, some, some people like electric cars and some people like Kia, some people like Mercedes. I mean, I think, I think it, I would argue wherever people move to, there's opportunity. Or even wherever people are, there's opportunity. Right. So I think... You can make money in Toronto, you can make money in Quebec, you can make money in, in, in Cairo and Egypt, if you know what you're doing, right? right? You can lose your shirt in Vancouver or you lose your shirt in Calgary, right? I mean, I think you've you, you got to be a bit more nuanced because there is probably some awesome hotel deals out there right now. Hotels are at super low occupancy rates right now, right? There's no traveling allowed today and it might, will be restricted for the next foreseeable future, right? Um, and people might decide to fly an airplane with freaking mask on for five hours. Maybe it's not such a good idea. So maybe flights to, to Hawaii are not, not so hot anymore, right? Or to Maui or to Mexico. Um, so there's probably opportunity for you in the hotel space, as an example. If that's what turns you on, right? It doesn't turn me on. I don't want to own a hotel, but maybe you do. So I think if you pick up a hotel at 20 cents on a dollar, you can make a fortune if you know what you're doing. Right. But if you pay 40 cents on a dollar, you might lose your shirt. Right. So, and maybe the break even point is 28 cents on a dollar, right? I'm not, I'm not sure yet, right? Similarly with, with office buildings or with retail malls, right? There's that you're going to see a ton of vacant retail the next year, right? And office, so people realize, Hey, I can work from home now. Yeah. Many firms say, you know what, why do I have 5,000 cubicles in some high, some high rise downtown if I need maybe only 2,000? So I think even banks in downtown Vancouver, uh, Vancouver or, 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 or Toronto will downsize their floor space, I would think. Right. right. 
So there'll be there's probably some pain now in the office space in downtown Toronto, I would think. Again, I'm not a commercial leasing expert. Yeah, I, I would I would think I would think so for sure. Um, you go through any asset class, and I think it matters in the end what is the specific deal at a specific price point. Um, I mean, I live now at the Sunshine Coast, which is just north of Vancouver. You can you can buy marinas, for example, with boats on them, right? Which is like a mobile home park. You you lease the you lease the space and the water for like I don't know two hundred bucks a month to park your boat. There's a business opportunity, right? And you take the boat if they don't pay you. Exactly, right? Or, or similarly, similarly, mobile home parks. Or there's prefab homes now where you can buy homes for hundred thousand dollars, right? And put them on on mobile home park. Uh, pads. I mean, I think there's all sorts of opportunities, prefab opportunities now, people are trying to build hotels or, or uh, you know, apartment buildings, kind of cookie cutter prefab. I think there's opportunity in that space. Um, there's certainly space in buying old and ugly apartment buildings, fixing them up. But again, I think that it matters always where is it and how much do you pay for it, right? Like any business, you need to know what you're doing and you need to know what's the right price because at some at price x you might make money and at price x plus 30 percent you lose money right so somewhere between x and x plus 30 percent is is the sweet spot where you say don't go above that because you're going to lose money right? right and that depends highly on the location depends highly on the asset class and depends highly on the specifics of that that location and that building right and, and what might work in hamilton might not work in kitchener Right at that same price point. So I think you got to understand both the asset class and the location. Um, so I'm, I'm, for some, I'm, I will probably go back to Dallas, maybe looking at some buildings in Dallas. Um, but that's a different market than Houston, for example. And then you leave Texas, you go to Oklahoma or Arizona or California, totally different market, right? Right. Um, so it, it certainly helps to specialize in a certain location and a certain asset class right once and once you build a certain expertise let's say in my in my specifics in my uh, case i know apartment buildings really well you can probably shoot me into let's say atlanta georgia and within a few days i can probably find you a good building building i haven't never never been to atlanta and never, don't really know what's a good area in atlanta or not but i know it's a big city with lots of a areas lots of crappy d areas and, and lots of opportunity and I can probably within a few days find find a decent building to buy, right? right? Because I know the asset class well, but I don't know the location well. But the location, you can find people to help you, realtors, property managers, you know, local experts, and they tell you, don't buy on this street. It's a really crappy street. You know, you collect rent with a gun. You know, <coughs> and the, the rent collection might be might be deadly, right? So maybe you wouldn't want to want to buy there, right? Right. <laughs> um, because that that does exist in the U.S., right? There are certain pockets of, of the country maybe you and I shouldn't walk around without a gun, right, or without a protection. Right. And that, and and that, but local people would know that, right? And this is a Mexican gang, so you got to pay them off. Stuff like that, you got to know that, right? Right. Um. So I can probably make money in apartment buildings in almost any city because I know I have that expertise, right? But you still got to add your local expertise to it and, and to come out and say, yeah, that building in Atlanta at 85 a door is a good deal, but at 95 a door is not anymore, right? right. And, with that, and that takes some discerning, obviously, in some local research to, to discern that. Right. Is 85 a door for this building in Atlanta a good deal or not? Right. And it might be, it might not be. Um, so we, we asked this question to each one of our guests. It's called the three truths. Uh, so imagine uh, years from now, year, many years from now, and you live a, a long and very successful life, uh, and as you already have, but even more, and you achieve everything, <laughs> you, everything you ever wanted to, um, but for whatever reason, it's your last day, and, and everybody's around you who you love, all your family and your friends and your kids and your grand, grandkids, uh, and they're all around you. Um, and everything that you've ever written, every presentation you've ever given, it's all been erased. Um, and you have three short notes that you can write to them about uh, about anything, how to live life, investments, yeah. anything at all. Uh, what would you put on those notes? I see. You should give me some warning. I could have made research that a bit further. Well, but, you, uh, you've, you've written 80, 80 lessons, so it could be one of those. could be three, uh, three well, of three. I mean, I mean, I think one is 
certainly in this time of you know ever changing environments and crises, it helps have a specific skill, right? So I think, especially for younger people, you, you got to learn a certain skill, whatever turns you on. It's, some people want to be lawyers, that's fine. Or someone want to be accountants, that's fine. Some people want to be a builder or a plumber or a painter or a truck driver or a hairdresser, whatever turns you on, right? Um, so I think hone your skill and, and, and so it's, and then, because then you can turn that skill into money, right? I think too many people today, especially in sort of liberal arts colleges, graduate when they're 25 years old and they really have no skill, right? And then they end up becoming a barista maybe at somewhere or work at Walmart. But I think if you had become a, at least a hairdresser, for example, you can always make money there doing that or be, you become a plumber. So I think that's sort of number one, just try to work on the skill. Um, what else is a good truth? I think it's it's important to to look for the the sunshine or the or the hope in, in any situation because there's always crap around you. And if it's COVID right now, there's all sorts of depression and job losses and um but you know look look for look for the, the upside, right, in, in, in every bad situation. I mean in fact that the Chinese symbol I think for for crisis and for opportunity is the same symbol. Mm. Right, so in every crisis there's opportunity, right? So right now you're going to have some people losing their homes, for example, because they can't pay their mortgage. And guess what? You can probably pick up some houses now in, in a good area in Toronto, even, or in Calgary or in Vancouver for 20% less than it was two months ago, right? If you just happen to have that cash available, that credit, right? And you're ready to... to um, so that's another... Um, lesson perhaps, or insight into life. Um, that's what it was. I mean, chapter one of my book was man plans and God laughs, which basically means, yeah, you should work through life and you, you should plan things out and try to set goals. That's certainly useful, but you don't control everything, right? You might get cancer tomorrow and you might have a car accident tomorrow. You know, someone might stab you on the, on the street. I mean, you don't know. Someone sneez, sneezes on you with COVID and guess what? You're going to be sick and you might be dead. I mean, you don't know, right? <laughs> so, so don't maybe have a bit more humility and be a bit more humble that despite all your skills and despite all your things going for you, things can turn around pretty quickly, right? Right. Um, so, so maybe have faith and, and, and pray or look for a higher entity if you want. Um, but y yes, you can control things and you can write things down and have written goals and all that good stuff. And, and you know, you should go for that. Absolutely. But but be mindful that crap happens, right? So, <laughs> so uh, just roll with it, right? So if someone hands you lemons that make lemonade, I mean that that does happen, right? And not everyone is has dealt you good cards. And sometimes you have bad cards and bad genes, or you know you come up with a certain upbringing, or you you know lose all your money. That that could happen, right? I love yeah. it. So so. Hone your skills, find opportunity in crisis, and shit happens. So make lemonade. Well, you should have to open, 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 open. Let's, let's, let's make sure that you know not not everything which happens to you is is, is your fault, perhaps either, right? Right. Um, to mess that stuff happens and pay the hand you're dealt. That does this roll with it, man. You know. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here and uh, and. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Yeah, you're awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah, go for it, guys. Thank you.